The big announcement that I have been waiting to make and the secret that I've been keeping for months is that Inner City Books is back and they have just published their first title in five years. Inner City Books, Studies in Jungian Psychology by Jungian Analysts, was founded by Jungian analyst Daryl Sharp in Toronto, Canada in 1980. Its mandate was, and still is, to promote the understanding and practical application of the work of C.G. Jung. It truly is one of a kind and second to none. The last book that was published by Daryl was in 2017, Title 145, Carl Jung and Arnold Toynbee, The Social Meaning of Inner Work by Jungian analyst and frequent speaking of Jung guest J. Gary Sparks. Daryl passed away on October 8th, 2019, and Inner City Books now has a new incarnation under Scott Milligan, who worked alongside Daryl for many decades. Please see episode 71 of Speaking of Jung from 2020, when I spoke with Scott, Daryl's sons, Dave and Ben, Daryl's partner and editor, Victoria Cowan, and Daryl's companion, Liz Jefferson. It was only natural for Scott to take over inner city books after Daryl passed away, and I'm so glad he did. Scott has just published inner city books' first title since taking over. It was written by one of Speaking of Jung's most beloved guests, J. Gary Sparks. Title 146, The Call of Destiny, an introduction to Carl Jung's major works, is being released today, March 1st. 2023. A few weeks ago, I recorded a video interview with Gary about the book, and it is episode 119 of Speaking of Jung, which you are about to see. The book is now available directly from Inner City Books. They ship worldwide. Go to innercitybooks.net or click on the link in the description of this video or on the episode 119 page at speakingofjung.com. I would also like to mention that Inner City Books is in the process of bringing back some of their out-of-print titles. They've already republished John Dorley's book, Title Seven: The Psyche as Sacrament, a comparative study of C.G. Jung and Paul Tillich, and they are in the process of reintroducing three more. Title 64, Sacred Chaos, Reflections on God's Shadow and the Dark Self, by the late Jungian analyst Francois O'Kain. Title 18, Hags and Heroes, A Feminist Approach to Jungian Psychotherapy with Couples, by Polly Young Eisendrath. And Title 36, The Cassandra Complex, Living with Disbelief, A Modern Perspective on Hysteria, by Lori Leighton Scapira. So please look forward to those and more. And now, Here is my conversation with Gary Sparks about his new book, The Call of Destiny. I'm Laura London, and this is a very special video edition of Speaking of Jung. Returning to the podcast for episode 119 is Jungian analyst and author J. Gary Sparks in Indianapolis, Indiana. He returns today to discuss his new book, the first publication from Inner City Books in five years, The Call of Destiny, an introduction to Carl Jung's major works, will be released on March 1st, 2023. Gary Sparks holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Bucknell University, a Master of Divinity and a Master of Arts in Pastoral Counseling from the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, and a Diploma in Analytical Psychology, the degree of a Jungian analyst from the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich. His thesis advisor was Jung's closest student and collaborator, Marie-Louise von Franz, who also happens to be the honorary patron of Inner City Books, and his training analysts included Jung's grandson, Dieter Baumann, and Jung's close friend and confidant, C.A. Meyer. Mr. Sparks has been a lecturer and seminar presenter at the C.G. Jung Foundation of Ontario, Canada, 
and a teacher for the Analyst Training Program at the Research and Training Center for Depth Psychology, according to C.G. Jung and Marie-Louise von Franz in Zurich. He has presented online to the Cambridge Jungian Circle and for the new Jung at Heart Certificate Program for non-clinicians offered by the C.G. Jung Institute of Los Angeles, where his next presentation on Jung's first mandala will be held on June 3rd. He has joined me on four previous episodes of Speaking of Jung, the first three each centered around one of his books. Episode two on At the Heart of Matter, Synchronicity and Jung's Spiritual Testament. Episode 28 on Valley of Diamonds, Adventures in Number and Time with Marie-Louise von Franz. And episode 35 on Carl Jung and Arnold Toynbee, The Social Meaning of Inner Work. Our most recent talk, episode 114, centered around one of Mr. Sparks' specialties, Aurora Consurgence, republished last year as volume seven of the collected works of Marie-Louise von Franz. Please be sure to watch that video interview on our YouTube channel. It's one of our most popular episodes to date. In addition to his now four books, Mr. Sparks is the editor of Edward Edinger's Ego and Self, The Old Testament Prophets, and co-editor with Daryl Sharp of Edinger's Science of the Soul, A Jungian Perspective. He maintains two websites, jgsparks.net and jungandpauli.net, both filled with information, audio downloads, and PDF study guides. Currently, he works in private practice in Indianapolis, Indiana, where he also conducts a variety of study groups. Please visit our website, speakingofyoung.com, where you will find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This video interview is being recorded on Friday, February 3rd, 2023, through the magic of StreamYard. Welcome back, Gary. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for having me. It is Always a pleasure being here. Well, we're very excited, aren't we? This I'm is, excited. You're excited. We are recording this uh, in February, but on March 1st, your new book will be released by Inner City Books. It's their first title in five years, not I'm since... Yeah, not since your third book, uh, Carl Jung and Arnold Toynbee, uh, was published in 2017. It's an honor to be back with those guys who are an absolute pleasure to work with. Well, Daryl Sharp, our mutual friend, uh, who passed away on October 8th, 2019. Uh, Scott Milligan, now who worked alongside Daryl for decades, has taken over Inner City Books, which is truly one of a kind. Uh, they are second to none. I love those guys. I love them too. And uh, Inner City Books was my introduction into reading about Jungian psychology. So the new book, uh, it opens with a remembrance of Daryl Sharp. And you write, there are yet further reasons from a broader horizon why I sorely miss Daryl Sharp. And those reasons have to do with his role in developing and sustaining Jungian psychology in North America. I do not believe what Daryl did for Jung's opus in the public eye has been matched in our time by anyone. It's amazing how he came back from Zurich and said he had an excess of energy. He wanted to publish his thesis and he couldn't get any takers. Marion Woodman had written her first book and she couldn't get any takers. And he said, well, why don't I start a publishing company myself? He had worked in publishing uh, prior to that. Uh, I think he partly financed his training in Zurich by working for American publishers, you know, at, uh, at a distance. And uh, then it took off. And I'm sure those people that turned down Marion are regretting the decision because she has sold millions of books. Yeah. This book is fantastic, of course. Uh, everything you write is. 
But in particular, this book I think is so timely and powerful. I've read it twice. Uh, Inner City Books was kind enough to provide me with a, a an advanced copy. And in the in that same beginning, um, the introduction, uh, a remembrance of Daryl Sharp. I, I this is so funny. I want to read it. Um, but I also think that this is important. You say, Daryl and I belong to a very elite Jungian club. I'm not sure how many of us there are in the world, but as far as I am aware, there are only three members of our club in North America. Daryl, myself, and our co colleague in Hartford, Connecticut, Jim Shearer, who was my guest in episode 39. So I've had all three of you on the podcast. You say the club is so specialized that it does not even have a name. So I have affectionately dubbed it with the title myself. I call it the Marie Louise von Franz kicked our butt club. Von Franz kicked your butt. Tell us how. Well, all three of us failed her fairy tale exam. The way the training program is set up, you have to do. Uh, two series of eight exams, one about halfway through and uh, one at the very end. One halfway through, that's the scary one because at that point they can mm. say, well, it's clear you don't have it. <laughs> and I failed, uh, Daryl failed, uh, Jim failed. To, to Daryl, she said, uh, uh, either you are a ninny and shouldn't be here or else you have talents as of yet undiscovered. Mm -hmm. To Jim, uh, she said, uh, Dr. Scherer, your problem is your American education. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> and to, to me, she said, Mr. Sparks, what you said in the exam was just plain stupid. <laughs> it's hilarious because of... It's hilarious now. Now, right, now, because of who you are now and all three of you. Um, and I really think that's the beginning of my training. Yeah. I, I thought I knew what I was doing. I mm. did not. And it took somebody of her caliber to tell me that mm. for me to go back and reevaluate everything, how I was studying, what I knew, what my attitudes toward Jung were, what kind of student therapist I would be. Uh, I mean, I was devastated. There she was, my hero, heroine, and telling me I was an idiot. And the worst part of it was she was right. So uh, I, I really started to take the journey to the unconscious seriously. And I think that's what she gave all of us. You know, if you're going to do this work, there are things you've got to know. You, you can't just play around with dreams. And um, I, I remember my own analyst saying, someday you're going to be glad this happened. Certainly wasn't at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I am. I'm very glad. And, and she didn't let up uh, uh, when you, you take an exam. Uh, I think it's probably still the same. You you meet with the examiner in their office or their home. She worked in her home uh, before the exam, whether you are taking it or retaking it. And the other students who are taking it are there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went back, you know, swallowed my pride, bared my juggler uh, six months later to the meeting at her house with me and maybe half a dozen other students. And she talked for an hour, why arrogant people fail exams. Mm. <laughs> so I got the point. You got the point. Yeah. And I don't want to give away too much of what's in this uh, book. So uh, you say as much or as little as you'd like. Yeah. Uh, that, that introduction is fantastic because you talk about how you met Daryl and how you wanted to quit. You wanted to get out of there. You were done and yeah. why you didn't and why you stuck with it. And what Daryl said to you uh, is something that um, I think we could all use. Uh, and he, he, without Daryl, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. It's that simple. No, I may I have the same way. jumped, jumped off a bridge. I don't know. 
Hmm. Yeah, when I first met him, it was about a month after I had arrived in Switzerland. I will never forget the day. I never f will forget where we're standing. I don't know how well you are familiar with Zurich, but it's a place is called Bellevue Plot. It's a, it's a kind of a tram place where trams meet and you, you exchange for going here or there. You change trams. And we were... We flag, he flagged me down, how you doing? And he introduced himself and said to me, how you doing? And I said, I'm terrible. Everything's going wrong. I didn't have any money. The money I thought I would get, I thought I'd get a fellowship, fell through. I said, this is not going to work. It's just, it just seems impossible. And he said, well, you know, it's supposed to seem impossible. Yeah. Else you wouldn't get, it wouldn't bring out your best. Mm. And I didn't give up. And then the same situation, golly, what, three years later, I uh, had run out of money again. Mm. I was staying at a friend's apartment, hitchhiking back. I didn't have money for anything except uh, uh, she didn't charge me for staying at her apartment uh, for, for, you know, modest food. And I couldn't, uh, usually you got a ride in about two, three minutes in those days anyway. Mm -hmm. Got your thumb, somebody would stop. Wow. And nobody stopped. Nobody stopped for like a half an hour. And I thought, what's going on? And up pulls Daryl Sharp in his uh, Fiat Auto Bianchi, little tiny car. And he said, get in, I'll give you a ride. And he said, how you doing? I said, I'm sucking. I'm going to have to give up. I'm out of money. And he said, well, I have these teaching jobs at the Zurich public school system, which pay f fantastically. I'm graduating. Do you want the jobs? I didn't even have to interview them. Yeah. Them. Just yeah. on Daryl's word alone. I remember getting the course catalog. It was the commercial high school of Zurich evening school. And my name was listed for the courses and I hadn't even interviewed. Ah. <laughs> and my boss was the most fantastic guy. Uh, it was totally a positive experience. And it also allowed me not to be living hand to mouth. You know, right. which you have to do often. And I made friends and I, I uh, got to know the Swiss and I was invited into homes and I had a social life. Um, it, it made the Zurich experience uh, bring Switzerland very close to me mm. and help me understand what, you know, what's the world Jung lived in and what's yeah. it like? Because when you go there, it, it, the Swiss seem to be off-putting mm -hmm. and they are in a public sphere, but in the personal sphere, I mean, uh, this is why Rilke lived there and, and uh, Kafka mm -hmm. and, and Wagner and uh, Hesse. All these people lived there for that rich mm -hmm. interpersonal dimension of life, which they don't show easily until you uh, have a way in. Yeah. Teaching gave me a way in. Ah. So you had the full experience and... Uh, yeah, it was wonderful. I had five years of working and living in Switzerland on the economy. I didn't have any extra money, but I had enough money to travel mm -hmm. you know, uh, third class and stay in working class hotels and uh, make friends, go skiing, uh, hang out in pubs, talking to people and getting to know the Swiss, uh, Swiss mind and the Swiss soul. It is beautiful. Is that still being done today? It doesn't seem like much with all this online training. Uh, having the exper the lived experience. I wonder about the same thing, Laura. Yeah. When, when when I was there, of course, there's no internet. Right. And you you lived and worked uh, with your fellow students, which was an advantage in some ways, also a disadvantage because it kind of narrowed your world. And I was able to move beyond that and make friends just in the general society. Mm -hmm. But it was a, it was a hotbed and you knew what all your friends were going through and we would meet for beer and talk about them. And uh, the camaraderie was part of the training. Part of the training. Yeah. 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 So uh, this book and uh, you've also relayed stories on some of our, on, on all of our previous episodes. So uh, if the listeners would like to hear more about uh, what, your experiences were in Zurich. We've touched on them in the previous episodes that yeah. we did. And today uh, I'd like to talk about this new book, which mm -hmm. 
uh, I'm so excited about. I've read it twice, uh, as I said, and it has come at the perfect time. I know for me, and I think for this community. So thank you. I hope so. When did you have the idea for this particular topic? This has been a work of about 10 years. 10 years. Okay. And it started when I was uh, traveling around giving lectures and uh, mm -hmm. seminars and things. And people would say to me, um, you know, I, I, I know the basics and there are plenty of good young 101s out there. Right. I know the basics and I've taken a basic course, but where do I go from here? Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, why not read Jung? And they say, oh, it's too difficult. And I would point out, but Edinger has study guides, to all the major works. And they would say, but even those are too difficult right. for me. So I was trying to build a, a bridge between Jung 101 getting them ready to read Edinger if they wanted to and dive into the collected works. It is possible to read Jung. It takes a bit of patience yes. and, and help folks position themselves where they could begin reading. And I always say, look, just read for what you can understand. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about what you cannot mm -hmm. understand. Good point. You can always reread it. Yep. And uh, so the goal was to introduce people to really Edinger's guides, preparing them to read Jung's last work, which are the major ones. Uh, it was uh, reinforced by, uh, I hate to, hate to say it, but meaning uh, current trainees and, and current analysts who have no idea what Jung is talking about. They're basically taught object relations with uh, Jungian words. A good Ooh. friend of mine was in training at a certain Jung Institute, and uh, people would say, well, I'll use a different name. Well, Mary, you're the one who reads Jung. What does Jung say about that? And she quit. Yeah. Jung was not discussed. And then she went uh, on to become a psychiatrist. Mm. Uh, and is now working Jung into her medical practice. Mm. But this is not an isolated incident. Okay. Okay. And that upset me terribly. So in this book, you say your intent is to present an overview of how and to what end Jung's work developed into a coherent worldview over the course of his life. And you look at his four... the major works at, Four at, major the, works, at yeah. the end of his life, Symbols right. of Transformation, so which was originally written in 1911, 1912, but then it was republished in 1952 as volume yeah. five of his mm -hmm. collected works. You look at Mysterium Conjunctionis, uh, which was volume 14 of mm -hmm. his collected works, and you say is it is his magnum opus. Yes. You look at Ion. Do you pronounce it Ion? I do. Okay. Which is volume nine, part two, and answer to Job, which is, uh, pu which was published in volume 11 of his collected works. Correct. And the presentation you say in the book is not in chronological order, uh, but it reflects the way in which Jung's late work build. Yes. It was built the, the late works were built on each other. Right. So would you tell us a little bit about how you see that they were built on each other? Yeah, uh, gladly. The, the idea, just to go back to the first thing you said, was to give people as best I could between two covers, what is Jungian psychology basically about? Yeah. And knowing that, I think when you read uh, the study guides or you read Jung, you can place the ideas in each book uh, in perspective of an overall authorship and an overall understanding of, 
of his view of therapy. And, and that should make it a little easier. Otherwise, you know, there you are in Mr. M. Cunantionis reading about some king crawling into his mother's body. You think, yeah. good Lord, what right. are you talking about? <laughs> right. um, but when you know that Mysterium is talking about a major transition in value systems through an organic process, they can say, oh, okay, that's what we're doing here. So that that was um, uh, kind of what uh, I guess you could say got me going. Now, one of the things I learned too while writing this was, uh, in a way, an answer to your question: How do these uh, works build on each other? And let me just give you a quick uh, tour through them: How they are related, yeah. because it's really. Uh, the thoughtfulness he put in these works is, is for me, is astounding. Mm -hmm. Volume five, which, you, as you said, was written in 1912, 1913, is rewritten in 52. Mm -hmm. 52 version is very close to the 1912, but it's been polished up. Yeah. And um, let, let me read you a couple of uh, key paragraphs, or really key sentences, which I think define the entire opus of Jungian psychology. Mm. Volume five, to just hit the absolute main points, is Jung's study of a young woman whom he didn't know. It was uh, He took the text from a journal uh, published in um, French from the University of Geneva of her fantasies on the boat she was an American from, uh, I guess, New York to Geneva. One of her fantasies is she sees a handsome shipmate, Italian, singing to the sea at night. And she writes a poem in which the main image is God. God is the creator that is evoked by this guy's song. Well, now a Freudian would go bonkers over that. See that that that's an incest theme, they would say. Hmm. Um, Jung doesn't necessarily agree that is always false. But again, to make a, a long story short, his approach is to say something was happening in her to take her energy and put it into another framework. And that's the nature of psychological transformation. It doesn't have to be regressive. Why do we assume that the God image is God the Father, is purely about uh, the Father? Uh, it could be about the mystery of life. And so he tries to show, uh, again, I'm making a very short, Mm -hmm. how what Freud says can be true, but doesn't always have to be true. Okay. This was one of the points that caused the end of the relationship. Mm -hmm. In other words, that not only the past, but the future as well can determine psychological processes. And that's, that's a fundamental part of Jung. Yeah. Uh, again, making it... Uh, uh, somewhat simplistic, but to get the main point across, let me read you two sentences uh, from, uh, let's see if I got the reference down. Uh, this is from volume five, paragraph uh, 508. Um, what he says is that the, the subject being I will say, assaulted by this erotic religious imagery is being invited to turn into herself mm. to see the images that that experience is being symbolized by and therefore how she can grow through the experience from now into the future. So let's see if this quote makes sense. 
whoever sets foot in this realm of the unconscious, when you turn inward Mm -hmm. in these moments, whoever sets foot in this realm of the unconscious submits his conscious ego personality to the controlling influence of the unconscious. Now, what's so unique there, see, for Freud, the unconscious is a big garbage pail. Mm-hmm. Jung sees that when under certain circumstances, when the imagery inside is activated and we begin to pay attention to it, it knows more than we do. It knows how our life can move forward. Mm-hmm. A similar quote, just a few paragraphs later. Uh, and these are, I think, the three most important words in the book, and in a way for all the books that followed. Um, So you know he's talking about going inside, watching your dreams, what the dreams can offer you is, is guidance. And so he says, the unconscious takes over the forward striving function, the process of transformation in time and breaks the deadlock. The contents then pouring into consciousness are archetypal representations of what the conscious mind should have experienced if deadlock was to be avoided. Mm. The key words there are forward striving Mm. function. The unconscious is an active knower. If we can go Mm. inside and listen, uh, will guide us into the future. Now, that's his very first formulation. And I, I feel those three words have then occupy Jung for the rest of his life. Mm. The forward striving function. Yeah, and in the book, you have a section titled The Most Important Words. And yeah. you, you quote Jung, and then you say Jung would, will spend the rest of his life yeah. expanding on that statement, that yeah. first one that you read. Yeah, I think that, that's how I understand it anyway. Now, so each of the major works take up those three words from a different perspective. Mm. Mysterium, well, let me back up. Um, that's a little too simple. The unconscious takes over the forward striving function. Sometimes just going inside, you can see the dreams do that. Okay. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then Jung started asking why? Because other things are necessary of consciousness to activate Mm -hmm. that capacity of the unconscious. Jung turned to three different mythological paradigms. Alchemy, again, making it quite uh, simplistic, shows that in order to activate the healing power, you have to face your opposites. Mm. So carrying conflict at times is necessary to release that forward striving function. I don't know why. Sometimes it's right there at the beginning. Sometimes you have to work for it. Mm-hmm. The uh, and then in Ion, what he does is he says, "Oops, there's another condition that sometimes you have to uh, complete, and that is withdrawing projections. The uh, transformative capacity of the unconscious is not reached without your dealing with projections. For that." He goes to the Gnostic myth, which I'll mention. We can come back to it if you like. Okay. Um, in Gnosticism, which is basically a Christian sect, S-E-C-T, mm-hmm. uh, although uh, Jewish Gnosticism is certainly known. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as its impact on our civilization, it's it's the uh, Christian Gnosticism. Um, not saying one's more important than the other, it's just the way things played out. Um, God gets trapped in the world at creation. Mm. And the, what the Gnostic believer has to do is live so that out of their religious experiences, out of their devotion, and certainly at their death, the part of God in them goes back to God. Mm. So God needs uh, redemption, not the individual. Mm. 
But the idea is that divinity is lodged in matter. And for Jung to get to that divinity, uh, or in our language, to get to our higher knowing, you have to face parts of life where you are projecting part of yourself into life events and extract that out. Mm. So alchemy, conflict, Gnosticism, withdrawal of projection mm. and extraction. The last one he does uh, is Answer to Job, which is a very difficult and upsetting work. I, I freely admit it. Edinger in his study guide says, you know, if you're not upset by it, you don't understand what you was mm. talking about. The idea is that uh, God really doesn't know what he's doing. And he is not only amoral, he's immoral. For that example, he chooses the book of Job. And he says, look what this guy did to Job. What did Job do wrong? Now, folks will say, well, you see, God knows better. We shouldn't question. And Jung says, bullshit. We have to hold God to our own moral standards. And what Job did was argue back to God until he couldn't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. And the traditional interpretation of that is you see, Job finally realized God, God know, uh, Job knows God knows better. And Jung says, what's he supposed to do when looking down the barrel of a howitzer? Yeah. That is not a religious conversion. That's a bully beating up somebody else. As I said, this is very upsetting. But what Job does, he, he stands against the dark side of God, and that gets God reflecting on himself. And then that's what then causes Sophia to appear the feminine side of God in the later books of the Bible that follow the book of Job. What that means for us as, as therapy, we have to, under certain circumstances, maintain our innocence. The first thing people will say or will try to, you know, get you to feel, I, I think of an example of a woman I worked with uh, who had been raped. And she went to another woman, therapist, and that woman helped her deal with the police and file a report and everything like that. Uh, then the woman started, the, the, and Alizane started having dreams and the uh, therapist referred her to me. But the story came out, sure enough, when they went to the police station, the cops said, what did you do to deserve it? This is our ingrained prejudice that if you're a victim, you've done something to deserve it. Yeah. And Jung's position is, no. You have to hold your innocence against the recriminating voices that would try to defeat your sense of integrity then this guidance that we've been talking about will manifest. So, so you've got mm. sometimes to, to face conflict, sometimes to withdraw projections, and sometimes, not very often, thank goodness, but with people who have been the object of trauma or evil, uh, you have to maintain your innocence, and the therapist has to help the person do that. If you talk to children, let's say, from a divorced family, first thing the kid will say is, well, you know, I, I didn't eat my peas. That's why mommy and daddy mm. divorced. That has to stop. So those, those three models are different takes on the forward striving function. How do you get it? He realized it was a bit more complicated. You just go inside. That sometimes works. But other times, nothing happens until you face your conflict, take responsibility for both sides, live through that, or you withdraw your projections, or you stand against uh, the general paradigm of blaming the victim. One of the things I neglected to mention earlier is that you say that Jung doesn't fully become Jung until 1928. Right. So 
these later works, the works that he wrote late in his life are young. And yeah. so would you say that everything was leading up to that? And is it a value to read his early works if, oh, yeah. if other than in a, his, for a historical perspective? Oh, well, the, um, what happened between 1913 in 1913, he was still under the sway of Freud mm -hmm. and really learning his craft. Mm -hmm. So uh, what he's written has more to do with some technical aspects of therapy than anything. Yeah. But as an overall view, he writes that he became interested in mythology to understand the bizarre mental productions of schizophrenics. Uh -huh. And from there, he came across Gnosticism. So he began reading Gnosticism. This is all 1913 to 1928. By 1928, he felt there was something missing. And that's when he got a uh, text from Richard Wilhelm, mm -hmm. A Secret of the Golden Flower, in which, which is a, a Taoist alchemical text, which shows uh, a breaking apart into opposites in a coming together. Mm -hmm. And he thought, my God, that's alchemy. Mm -hmm. So that's when he started reading alchemy. And so he got his basic ideas by 1928, I would mm -hmm. say. And then spent the rest of his life thinking through all the implications of what he discovered by 1928. So it's interesting if you realize in those writings between 1928 and 1944, uh, he's, he's fine tuning his ideas. And it's interesting to walk along with him as he does that, because what he writes there are, it's pretty, it's pretty reliable. I think mm -hmm. it, it, it's piece by piece. He's, he's putting together the worldview that he then feels is finished and then he can talk about by 1944. Did you write this in the book or I, I was listening to a lecture that you gave. I'm always reading and listening to multiple things at the same time. Were you were talking about the red book and saying that it wasn't necessarily, it didn't necessarily come out of his break with Freud. Absolutely not. It came out, because of the the times he was in and the war that's what i think was that in this book uh, i can't remember I don't, I now i don't remember either yeah i uh, thought that was so in, such an interesting observation and one that i agree with well what and thank you for mentioning that because this opens up for me a whole other dimension of jungian psychology mm. which if i live long enough i hope i can work on um i say Yes, the split from Freud was very upsetting to Jung. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned for both men. Sure. Yeah, I think it was in this book, Laura, that okay. uh, C.A. Meyer would say to me that uh, oh, yeah. he studied with Freud in Vienna. Yes, that uh, is in this book. As a young psychiatrist. And that would have been in the late 20s, early 30s. And every time he'd come back from... Uh, from Zurich, Freud would say, how's Jung? How's Jung? What's, how, how's Jung? So, you know, there was a real affection there. They just, they, they couldn't get along. Jung refused to accept the atheist position. Mm. And then Jung, if you remember in those face-to-face uh, -face interviews with John Freeman, uh, Jung is asked to talk about Freud's secret. And he says, no, I'm not mm. going to talk about his secrets. And the guy says, he's been dead all these years. And Freud says, these regards last longer than life. Yeah, Jung said that. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a great uh, affection there, which Jung could not. He says very clearly, I even marked it in case uh, it came up, in uh, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, page mm -hmm. 150, Jung says, I couldn't accept the atheism. And I had to go my own way. Mm -hmm. And you see that forward striving function, that's the bridge to theology. Mm. And Freud didn't acknowledge it existed. For Jung, it's the foundation. And yeah. the basic idea holds through each of those major works with a twist, looking at it from a different angle. Mm. Mm -hmm. With a twist. 
So there are two terms you say in the Jungian opus that you discuss throughout the book, and they are spirit and self. Yeah. Self with a capital S, yes. the Jungian term self and that they deserve special consideration as intricate themes that run through Jung's final works that link the works together. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about spirit and self. Let me start with the self. Okay. Um, a fundamental assumption of Jung is that we are who we are before we're born. Our identity is inborn putting it a little more precisely, the potential for our identity is inborn. We are not, we are shaped by the past, yes, because that can either enhance or inhibit who we really are. And inevitably, no matter how good the parenting, and certainly with bad parenting, uh, we lose touch with the fact that there is somebody in us already there. Mm. And that's a fact of life. I think certainly, you know, let's say things like uh, Montessori or uh, uh, um, Steiner education tries mm. its best to preserve that. But even so, you know, you have to poop at a certain time. You have to, do, you know, brush your teeth at a certain time. Uh, reality comes in and, and, and puts a, uh, uh, a block between you and that inborn identity, which is the self. That's the self. It's who That's you are, okay. who you are before you were born, which we lose. Then largely it comes back to us piece by piece. So we all lose it. I would say we all lose it. And that's just a result, a consequence of living in this physical socialization. World. Socialization. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't particularly care to pay for taxes, but too bad. You got to pay for taxes. Well, yeah. Well, that goes against my individuality. Well, too bad. Yeah. We'll put you over right. here. If that's your final point of view. Mm -hmm. um, the, The, there is a, a gradient inside us that's the forward striving function of the unconscious, which is built in as well, which tries to show us piece by piece who that original person is. Mm. That's what we find in the hero's journey when we are turn back and we find the, uh, the guiding influence of the unconscious. That's what comes up in collision between the opposites. That's what comes up in the withdrawal of projections. That comes up where there's been abuse and we stand against uh, the dark side of life. So that's spirit. Spirit is the forward striving function. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we have to do uh, at some times is simply sit back and listen that's pretty much what Jung was saying in volume five. Just turn mm -hmm. back to the unconscious and it will guide you. Sometimes it does, as I mentioned. Uh, sometimes we have to be more active facing our conflict or facing our projections or, or dealing with our over-responsibility or under-responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's what releases the forward striving function putting it in different words, that's the spirit at works. The spirit is the inner knowledge. Uh, do I, I think I may, do I have here von Franz's definition of spirit? Uh, yes, I do. Von Franz's definition of spirit. And while you're looking for that, I would like to mention this t-shirt that I'm wearing. Marie Louise von Franz, uh, one, of, one of Gary's teachers, one of the, or the honorary patron, uh, or I call her the patron saint of inner city books. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> These t-shirts uh, are available. Um, they were created by uh, a guest of, of ours, Timothy Hull. He is an art professor in New York City. He was um, I get one of my guests in episode 52. And he has an Etsy shop and the, it called Timoteo Tees. And there will be a link 
uh, to the t-shirt in the show notes uh, and in the description below, you can use a discount code Von Franz for 15% off. Here's her definition, what, yeah. Here it's in number and time, page 214. Spirit is that factor that creates images in the inner field of vision and organizes them into a meaningful order. Let me, mm. let me repeat that. Spirit is that factor which creates images in the inner field of vision and organizes them into a meaningful order. Uh, if I want to unpack that a little bit. Okay. Um, we, we not only have desires, we have images coming up from the unconscious. And when we work with them, we find when we understand one image, the next image is a step ahead of the previous image. Mm. And when we understand that, the next image is a step ahead. So that by following the images which are organized into the future, that's the spirit, and that mm. can guide us. That's why Jung makes so much of the spirit. It, it's not some woo-woo up in the sky. Right. It's how our imagery moves us forward mm. because there is an intelligence within us. Is he the only one who saw this, who uh, talks about this? Who, who? That's a good question. I would say no. But... There's something very special about him for yeah. me. Yeah. Um, I think that's really, a, a Christian would not have trouble with that. Okay. Th that's that's a religious point of view. That's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Jung says, I don't care whether it's holy or not. I am just care about how it works. Okay. What's unique about Jung is that it comes up from the bottom. What do you mean by bottom? By wrestling with your instincts, your disasters, yeah. your conflict, your lusts, uh, your mistakes through the dark side of life. That's what releases a different depth of the spirit for you. It is not separate from daily life. It comes out of the struggles with daily life. Earlier, when we were doing a sound check, uh, you showed me an image, and it's an, one of the images in your book. And I'm wondering if this might be, I mean, sometimes I jump around, if this might yeah. be a good place to bring that in. Yeah. Finding the spiritual fish yeah. within the material fish. Well, uh, you're, you're moving us on to ion. Okay. Here's Jung's, uh, this is going to get a little involved, so fasten your seatbelt. Yeah. Um, Jung's starting point is that there are two major periods of Western history, which are shaped by Christendom's portrayal of Christ. Mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago, the world was so crazy with gluttony and greed and murder, in other words, the late antiquity, that it's the enduring con contribution of Christianity that it introduced a spiritual savior that lifted people up above the perversity. Mm. And that's why monasteries are up high. It's a value system that uh, treasures the spirit, spirituality, goodness, kindness, um, peacefulness, generosity, not gimme, 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 greed, um, 
I don't care if it hurts you or not. I want what you got and so on. So that stamped Western civilization for the first thousand years with a spiritual accent. The problem is, valuable as that was, it did not take account of the base instincts of a human being. Mm. So around 1000 AD, until our time, there was a pendulum swing back to those base instincts, mm. to, in its more developed form, scientific revolution, the Enlightenment, um, the age of exploration, the material world became the focus of civilization from 1000 to 2000, where the spirit had been the focus of okay. civilization from zero to a thousand. Okay. That's ion in a nutshell, different periods of life. Where we are now is the end of the material phase. In other words, we've had a spiritual phase, We've had a material phase. And Jung says the danger is we're going to, the pendulum is going to swing back to a spiritual phase if we don't intercede and begin to realize that there is a way to find the spirit in the material. So I'm putting in a historical perspective what I just mentioned uh, a moment ago. That's our task of today. Mm. So that spirit of the first thousand years of Christianity, Jung would see as the same spirit that moves dreams forward. Mm. It is a non-biological uh, experience, although Jung says we've got to now find how that spirit can come out of biology and not come out of the heavens. And come stop. out of biology and not the heavens. And not the heavens. And out of our desires, our collisions, our mistakes, our lust, our greed. Um, and and where, where people, you know, you might think, well, that, that sounds impossible. But this is often why people come into analysis. Something yeah. went wrong. The marriage or the job or, or they, you know, the marriage triangle or they get busted for something or... Uh, whatever it might be. And what we do not say is, well, that was wrong. We say, can we turn this event into a matrix that will show you an inner guidance to move you forward? Mm. We embody the chaos. This is why we have to know these mythologies and how mm. they work. And what Jung talked about in Ion and in Mysterium and in Job, mm. uh, all the vicissitudes that are likely to appear in dreams when working this way. And that so that tragedy can release this uh, forward striving function. And it is of no use to say thou shalt not, which is what mm -hmm. the church says. Yeah. And Jung is saying, I agree that morality is the challenge of our time, but we've got to find a different way to get there. Because if you get there through thou shalt not, all you're doing is repressing what you, wanted, what you want to do. Right. And then you resent other people who are doing what yep. they wanted to do. Yep. So it sets up a shadow projection. Mm. That's Ion in a nutshell. And so you can see maybe Gnosticism as um, his guiding metaphor there is you go back to the earth where God is embodied. Mm -hmm. You go back to earth where the insight is embodied. For example, in Manichaeism, um, when, when God creates the world, uh, the female side of God gets trapped in the world. And that's Sophia who just happens to be a whore in the, a brothel in Tyre. So you see how they, they see the low presentation mm -hmm. of divinity, uh, which then we have to wrestle with to extract out the 
guidance that's in there. And there's no point in saying, oh, bad boy, bad boy. Yeah. Uh, symbolism. Yeah. Um, I have here, why and how did Jung become interested in symbolism? But I think you covered that. I mean, you're, you're talking about why he turned yeah. to mythology yeah. and alchemy and astrology and Gnosticism. And I think that sometimes either that turns people off uh, when it comes to Jung. Yes, or it does. It, it does. And also there's this, for me, I'm going to go off track a little bit here. There's this difference between reading Jung and going into Jungian analysis. Yes. And people want to, because I get a lot of emails and I'm sure you do too. And a lot of the listeners reach out to me and they want to read books. And they ask me, they say, I want to work on my anima. What book should I read? And I tell them, find an analyst. Yeah. And right. And in this day and age, and it's gotten even worse since I started the podcast in 2015, I think fewer and fewer people want to find an analyst. They just want to read something on the internet. They want bullet points. Tell us, because when I say it, I feel like it falls on deaf ears. Tell us why bullet points, quick and easy answers, aren't going to get them where they want to go. Well, I, I think I might say to him, dear madam or dear sir, uh, your question requires a two-step answer. Read the book. Here's the book. And then get into analysis. Mm -hmm. um, we're dealing with the unconscious. And no matter how hard we try to understand ourselves, it's almost impossible to get to your own unconscious without somebody's help. And I think one of our goals is to help people make this shift to the unconscious through the guidance of the therapist and then learn how to uh, start that process on their own. So that the goal is to get them where they want to go, but it's quite a detour to get there. What would you say uh, is happening to the field of Jungian psychology right now? I mean, I had somebody say to me, oh, you know, your your podcast is so small and, um, you know, you don't have tens of thousands of YouTube subscribers because this is a really niche field, yeah. a, a, a very specialized interest. And... I don't see it that way. No. I, I I don't. And so I'm sure that you've seen Jungian psychology or technically analytical psychology, but I don't typically say analytical psychology because most people don't know that that is right. Jung psychology. So whenever I say Jungian psychology, I feel like I'm, I'm, that's not the correct term. So how has it changed? Uh, since Jung's death, and where is it now, and where is it going? I, I mean, well, I wish I could be more affirming, but it's turned into a bourgeois tea time. Bourgeois tea time, okay. Um, it kind of breaks my heart to see. Yeah. I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I presented to a study group, I won't mention where, but overseen by a graduate Jungian analyst. Okay. And I talked about ion. Now, one of the key uh, images in ion is the fish. We didn't really get into it in my very simple uh, description. But the fish, images, fish image plays a supreme role throughout uh, that book. And uh, at the end, I presented some dreams of fish. All very moving. And the analyst said to me, well, isn't it true the, your analyst and uh, dreamt of the fish because you wanted her to? Because you wanted her to? I wanted her to. Because I have an interest in fish. 
Wow, that's a leap. That is a disgusting leap. A disgusting leap. Yeah, I was. That is object kind. relations. Because you wanted her to. Oh, is that a, a some other field of psychology where yeah. that is going on? Okay. Yeah, you're, they're getting an ed education in object relations with Jungian words. And object um, relations says everything that happens in the vessel is transference. Wow. Dreams are just a reflection of transference. How are they doing with that field? I don't know, but when they heard me, uh, hopefully I put a dent in it. Uh, I said to the guy, you know, I just think, oh, I don't believe I just spent two hours talking to these people. Um, does it matter to you that half of these dreams aren't from my analysis? Mm. No answer. Mm. That's typical. It's being watered down. It's being trivialized. The knowledge it takes to, uh, the mytholog mythological knowledge it takes to work with the unconscious is simply not there. And, and that's why it takes so long to train to become a Jungian yes, analyst. Yes, and why it's so damn hard. I mean, I had to learn all this stuff. Uh, you know, my undergraduate was engineering, and I thought, well, I'll go to theology to get depth. Theology made engineering look like poetry. And then Zurich mm. <laughs> on front says, you don't know what you're talking about. I didn't know the myth. Mm. I, I missed all the mythological associations in the fairy tale. Ah. And you can't, you can't interpret without knowing the mythological precedent of these images because often they're linked not by what we would call the manifest content, but by the earlier mythological links to that image is as similar to the mythological link to the image which follows. And you have to be able to do that to show mm -hmm. this forward movement. Um, but that's not being done. And it, it's become rational. Uh, it's become superficial. Um, I, I'm told that the, the these Jungian meetings are just awful places to go people are insulting each other and shadow is not worked through yeah uh talk to a friend in england it's not just this country who said she went to a group in england and she said i could never go back all they did was insult each other so wow. um yeah and then in my experience of young that was so different be, do, is it because you were there with his students? You I trained? think that I got the last hurrah. And the people that trained me, Jung had trained and had trained uh, my, my fellow students, uh, we all more or less got along. I mean, you know, there was some squabbling, but uh, uh, there was a coherent message. Learn this material, learn the unconscious language, and don't just be flying around with it. You have to be able to tie it down to practical daily experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's the spirit in the matter. That's the spirit in the matter. I love it. And yes, I share with you a discouragement of. That's why I'm not involved in any Jungian groups. I don't attend talks or lectures. And uh, I used to. Um, and I'm grateful that I did. It's how I met Daryl Sharp. Um, and then that's how I met you. Um, but I keep my circle very small because uh, there's a lot of bullshit out there. There are, there are a lot of people out there talking about Jung who have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. And I know that because... I know people who do know what they're talking about and you are one of them and you know Jung's work better than anybody I've ever spoken to. So I will continue to keep my circle small and actually even make it smaller. You know, I remember, do you know this name, Anne McGuire? Yes, from you. She, um, she was here and she spoke and her work I think is I see a direct line, Jung, von Franz, and McGuire. Her work is not published yet. Hopefully it will be. I think uh, her um, 
the executor of her uh, intellectual property in Zurich has, he said, 60 boxes of her papers. Wow. Um, we, she spoke here and there was a small crowd. And this has really helped me. And I said, you know, gosh, you know, your lecture was so good. I, uh, I wish we'd had more people. And she says, no, the larger the group, the more superficial. Mm. Keep this stuff small. <sighs> yeah. And that's helped me a lot. And, and so I don't worry about things like that. And what I find is the people who are calling me up for analysis, they all want to work. It is so rewarding. They all want to work. Yeah. They want to do the work. They want to do the work and they know the difference. Mm. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, that's uh, helped me a lot. Yeah. So I'd like to look through my notes really quickly to see if there's anything else we'd like to discuss about the new book. How about the red book? You want to talk about the red book? Very briefly. Sure. Uh, I won't go into the story of it, but why it's so important. And for me, it has opened up a whole new depth of Jung. Okay. And it's not totally unrelated to the book we're talking about because the Red Book is what started the process, which then became Jungian psychology, which was then mm -hmm. finalized in uh, um, his last works. Yeah. It's the difference between the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depths. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar? Oh, yeah. He has a view of history that takes account of emotions. Mm. I read a very, very interesting, well-written book uh, by a Margaret Macmillan. I forget the exact title on World mm. War One. I. I mean, okay. it's, it's, it's a beautiful scholarship, but it's all about the spirit of the times. Mm. This conflict between these two leaders and then this conflict in Africa and then this this colonial conflict down there and then this fighting over resources. And, and the Red Book shows that's important, but what about the images that are driving those events? The images that are driving those events, okay? That Jung has opened up for research. Mm. What images are driving our problems today? Our international mm. problems. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Um, I was working with a Chinese guy. And he dreamt. I'm going to change the details around a little bit. For protection. Uh, he, he has since left China. Um He's walking along in China with a little girl and a little boy. And a rabid bat swoops down and attacks the boy and kills him. And he's outraged. But there's nothing he can do about it. They walk further. The bat swoops down again and kills the little girl. Again, he's outraged. There's nothing he can do about it. And then he realizes he's next. That's when he realized he had to immigrate. Mm. He was outspoken. Um, what is that rabid bat in the Chinese psyche. Yeah. We can argue about the boundaries in the Pacific. We can argue about the China Sea. We can argue about trade until we understand that rabid bat. No progress is going to be made. And Jung opens up the understanding of international politics, and I would say national politics, to the collective unconscious and how do we work with it so that we can get to the source of these tragic events. It's one mm. thing to talk about gun violence, but what's the source of it? Right. What's the mythology yeah. underneath it? 
and, and until we can pass laws, and I'm not against that, but until that energy is seen and readdressed, the problem is going to remain. And right. Jung opens yeah. that up to inquiry, and I think it's a fantastic contribution, which I didn't see until I read the Red Book. Which you didn't see until you read the Red Book. Yeah. Because he does, that's what he does for World War I is show mm. the emotions that are causing the war. Not the reasons, but the emotions. And the only mm. person I know of who talks about the emotions um, behind war is Ken Burns. His most recent uh, documentary on World War II starts off with the emotions behind war, what's causing it. So maybe it's something that will be open in the future. And I think we can credit Jung for that. So what what can be done with that? I mean, if, if, if people hear that this can be looked at and worked with, it's be difficult to work with. I don't know, Laura. The maybe it's hopeless. Yeah. Maybe if we had a few conscious leaders. Mm. Suppose we had conscious leaders in China talking to conscious leaders in the U.S., talking to conscious leaders in Russia. It might be a much different game. Yeah, I don't know what to say. I don't either. But yeah. I... Uh, uh, It's one thing I think we unions can contribute. I'm not, I'm tired of getting my head bashed in. I've done pleasant, plenty of demonstrating. Um, getting here, your head bashed in where? In Berkeley. Okay. During the war, Vietnam Yeah, war. okay. <laughs> um, tear gassed. And mm. um, but maybe this is something we can offer. It's a point of view. It's a point of view. So you said that Jung's hope that his psychology would develop in the future with the next yeah. generation of Jungians. And he left some of his work unfinished. Uh, a for instance, a lot of it. Okay. So for instance, you told us in the episode that you and I did about number and time with Marie Louise von Franz that Jung left his work on numbers to her. Yeah, yeah. So what torches, what other torches did he pass on? Well, there's a wonderful video called Bolligan 1982, I think. Yeah. 1983, which is an interview with von Franz, where she talks about his la her last conversation with Jung mm -hmm. and what he talked about. What he talked about was, I really focused on the psyche. I know I focused on the psyche. I know there is a lot more to it. But, you know, with my profound realization, I only have one lifetime. Right. And uh, it quotes profound realization. Um, one of the things he said was the relation of the psyche and body. The relation, let's say, of the psyche to dream research, the cancer research. Mm -hmm. um, none of this has been explored. The only one right. really was Ann McGuire. And as far as I know, at any depth, some folks have touched on it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if those papers will ever get finished. 60, bo 60 boxes of papers. Uh, that's certainly one. And the connection between psychology and physics, yeah, that's, that's another one through Pali. And I think a tangential point there is what is the nature of science that it has contributed to the possibility of a world Armageddon? Mm -hmm. What can we do? in understanding what psychology can give to science and what science can give to psychology to help mitigate that. 
I would say it just in general, interestingly, the very first mandala, Sim, um, Sistema Munditiotis, mm -hmm. the first lines are about the antinomy of microcosm and macrocosm. Mm. Now, I had to look up the word antinomy. Mm -hmm. Antinomy is something that's logically false, but factually true. Like the electron is a particle in a wave. Mm. So logically, there's no connection between inner and outer. But factually, there is. Can we begin to understand how our inner psyche is affecting the outer world and how the outer world is affecting our inner psyche. This gets very close to synchronicity. Yeah. The, that has not been, none of this has been explored. That's huge. That's huge, yeah. To me, that's everything right there. Right. Now, the East, I think, is much farther ahead th than us on that one. Uh, <clears throat> a colleague of mine in Zurich uh, said he was lecturing in Japan on synchronicity and he said at the end of the lecture one of the guys in the audience came up to him and said well thank you for this lecture now i understand causality mm. so they live in that synchronistic worldview and we don't and we don't so the new book yeah titled the call of destiny did yeah. we did we really cover the word destiny no. and why you titled it the call of destiny, which I love that title. Uh, the idea was that each of these little pieces that come up, this, this uh, forward striving function, mm -hmm. that's giving us our genuine life and that genuine life fulfilling that is fulfilling our destiny. Fulfilling that is fulfilling, fulfilling our destiny. These, these guides that come from the inside, which are linking us back to who we're born to be. And somehow, even though that thing is in the past, it anticipates the future. That's following our destiny. Listening to our spirit is following our destiny. Uh, I would just like to mention to the listeners that when you were talking about the fish, there is an image in the book of what you were discussing and you go into great detail about that. That's one of my favorite parts of the book. Um, we will, Gary uh, said he's going to send me that uh, image and I will upload it to speakingofyoung.com uh, so that you'll be able to see what he was referring to. And Gary, uh, I know that this book isn't even out yet. We'll be out on March 1st, but are you working on any, a new book? Another well, at, book? at the moment, I, I ain't doing nothing. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, yes, there are things I want to work on. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I want to work on is the erotic transference. Ah, uh, yeah. I've got that about half written. Um, oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I would also, I believe, go back to the Pali material mm. and dive back into it. Well, gosh, it's been what over a decade since I wrote the first book. Um, mm. Try to understand what was really going on in him and what his contributions, not only to Jungian psychology, but to history and culture are. That, that's something I'd like to do. I'm very interested in that material and uh, my, my, I want to say my next guest, because these are going to be a little out of order, yeah. but uh, my guest for next week is Dr. Bernice Hill, oh. who, uh, do you know her? I don't know. You don't. So she's written about Jung's interest in flying saucers and UFOs and ETs and that whole dimension and what what's going on there from a Jungian perspective, because yeah. there's so much in the news right now. And there uh, is a retired CIA officer who's been doing a lot of podcast interviews and they're asking him, what is this? Are these extraterrestrial? Are these projections? Uh, what's going on? And he said that he thinks it's somewhere 
between the nexus of quantum mechanics and consciousness. Hmm. And so I thought, well, why aren't they looking at Jung? Why aren't they interviewing analysts? Or maybe they are behind the scenes. I don't know. Not that I know of, no. Uh -huh. But this, this work and that subject, I think, are very important right yeah. now. Yeah. So is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? I think we've done it, Laura. Have we? It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you, Gary. And I if we're wrapping up, let me just make a big thank you to Laura London for all the time you spend on this material. I, I am very appreciative of your presence and your efforts, Laura. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate your always being willing to come onto the podcast and talk to all of us. And I know you get a lot of um, feedback. You get a lot of uh, maybe emails from listeners. I, I know do, because yeah. they're always asking me for your email address yeah. or asking me how to contact you. You yeah. are definitely, I would say, our most popular guest. And so I really appreciate you giving me so much of your oh, time. It's an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Okay, so I'm just going to read the outro. Okay. Okay, so please visit our website, speakingofyoung.com, for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download commercial-free. The podcast version, version is also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music. So with special thanks to Scott Milligan and Liz Jefferson, the entire Sharp family, and most of all to you, Daryl. I'm Laura London, and you've been watching a very special video edition of Speaking of Young.